when we have a habit, it never goes away. Those neural pathways are already set. But the reality is just like the neural pathways of me drinking that 12 pack is there, the neural pathways of me ice plunging is also there. And that limits, uh, that reduces the barrier of entry for me to get back on track because I've had those, that, those habits established on my good days. So when I have my bad days, I have a little bit of an easier time getting back and ramped up. Here we go. Ted Faton on the Soul Seeker podcast. Long time coming. Thank you so much, brother, for your patience. Just saying before this, how to reschedule this due to my life recently. So I appreciate you so much and just your, your, your patience, really. <laughs> <There's so> many, <laughs> you know, and we were talking before we hit record about patience. So that's definitely a, a good place to start. Ted, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the pod. You have your own podcast, which I've been on, the Modern Man podcast. And by day, you are a meteorologist, huh? Why don't you tell us a little bit about your life and how patience plays a a role in your life? Absolutely, Sam. I I appreciate you having me on and and shout out to all the listeners and all the supporters. Make sure you give Sam the the flowers he deserves and and rate this podcast because I, I I know the labor that goes into making these productions and it, it's very important. And when it comes to patience, of course, man, like there's a lot of times in my life, I was thankful when the world showed me grace. And there's other times in my life where I was hopeful that the world, I wish the world would have shown me more grace. So I try and live like that and showing grace to others, because if anything, I don't show myself enough grace. And that comes into the topic of patience where I'm a morning meteorologist by, by day. I say that in air quotes because <laughs> 2 a.m., is not really in the day. I wake up 2.20 a.m. every day. That's in the middle of the night and you never get used to it for anyone that asks. I've been doing it for almost six, six, seven years now and still not used to it. But where I am now is a lot farther than where I used to be, but still leaps and bounds shorter than where I've aimed. And I've had to accept that gap. And that's where the patience comes into play because I I like to set big, hairy, audacious goals. I like to operate at a high level. And because of that, um, I probably stack too much on my plate than I can handle at one time. And that's bitten me in the butt a few times. But when it's come to patience, I have had to learn how to be grateful for where I am. Because a lot of times when we're climbing a mountain, we look up and we see how far the peak is or we're climbing the staircase and we look up and we see how many steps we need to go And it's just so daunting. And Sam, I haven't taken enough moments in life to look back, right? I used to always be like, never look back, never look back, right? I'm not going that way, so why look back? But when I've taken the time and kind of recapped like, okay, let me check my progress really quick. So not looking back because you're going that way, but checking my progress, I realize that I've gone farther than I've given myself credit for. And that's what's been helpful for the patients with me because you know, I think I'm always looking at that next peak. I'm always looking at that next goal. And and just like you could always get more money, you could always get that promotion. It's going to be a never ending chase that will leave me unfulfilled with every checkpoint. So learning how to acknowledge my progress, love where I am, be grateful for where I am, and be blissfully discontent with where I am has been kind of what I've embraced. And understanding that things will come in time. If I stick to the process, these are proven processes. When I go to the gym and I lift weights every day, it's it's a proven process and the results will come. Yeah, that resonates with me deeply. In yoga, we call it sadhana, which is all about being in the pursuit of, you know, it's cliche to say that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, but it's so true. And if we don't really find those habits and routines to build our sadhana, like what fills us up on a daily, weekly, even monthly basis, you know, for the things that you can't do every day or every week. And if you, if life just passes us by. And there's two things that typically happens, right? One, either we're so fixated on the outcome of success and just laser focus, or two, we just... I guess it's kind of one of the same. I lost my train of thought, but you know, we just aren't bringing intention to how we're spending our time 
And yeah. really the things that feed our soul, which is what I'm passionate about with the message of soul life balance. So with you, one thing I'm curious about is you mentioned that you've gotten into like getting past funks recently, like really working on like, what is it that gets someone in a funk and how do you get over that hump? That's something that everyone struggles with at whatever point in their life. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, man, funks, man, we're human and we make mistakes, right? And if, if anyone's like me and I imagine your audience, it just, I mean, the, the nature of the podcast, I think we are, we all have similarities. We're probably hard on ourselves. We are our worst critics. And I will get into a funk if I, I again, I have my to-do list of all the things I want to accomplish in a day and I don't finish that list. Or, you know, if my wife and I are just not resonating at the same vibration and there's some friction there, you know, that could lead into a funk. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you just, man, you just don't feel motivated to do what, what you have on your task. And this actually happened after a reflection of, of, of breathwork practice that I did. And I sat down and I identified that, man, I always feel great on Tuesdays. And for anybody that doesn't know, Tuesdays are the days that I record my podcast. I usually get my hair cut on Tuesdays and this is after work. And then I do two podcast sessions. And then after that, I spend time with my, I upload the episodes. I do some, some VA work, I contact my VAs and stuff. And then I have dinner with my wife and then I go to bed. Tuesdays are jam packed, Sam. Like I don't have any opportunity to lollygag. Like even my bathroom break is scheduled on that Tuesday, right? Yeah. And I, I was reflecting on that and I was like, I always feel great on Tuesdays. And I even looked at my journal from way back when it was October 8th, 2021, or I think it was, I forgot the specific date, but like I wrote down today, I was great, right? And I'm realizing this, this consistency of high energy whenever my schedule is packed. And I'm like, why is that? Well, because I wake up, I go to work, I come, I go to get my haircut, come home, use the bathroom, go to the gym, come home, two podcasts, literally while I'm drinking a shake, sometimes during the podcast, right? And then I'm uploading the episodes getting dinner with my wife and I go to bed. It's go, 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 go. But the habits and routines that are established in that day are all kind of associated and coincide with my highest values and really what I find purpose in. Sure, waking up early is not the best, but I always say that I love what I do, right? I, I get to be myself on air for my job as a meteorologist. I get to look, the, look at the weather, which interests me. I get to teach people about the weather, which is fun. And then afterwards, I get to work out, which, which is challenging at times, but it makes me feel fulfilled afterwards. And then I sit on a podcast and I get inspired by amazing people like you, other guests that I've had, and I, and I always leave the podcast feeling energized, right? And then after contacting the VA, I feel accomplished. And then I spend that time afterwards with my wife, usually after a long day of getting after it. And then it's just so comforting to sit back, veg out on the couch after breakfast, or after dinner, you know, watch a couple episodes of How I Met Your Mother, or whatever sitcom we're watching, just to unplug. And then I realize that my habits and my routines keep me out of the funk, right? It's it's literally my behaviors that override my emotions and my thoughts that allow me to operate in the things that make me feel valuable and fulfilled. Because a lot of times, what happens when we have the that funk, the thoughts and emotions? man, I don't feel like going to the gym today. Man, I don't feel like, you know, doing this next thing. And a friend of mine who first taught me the, the practice of breath work and we did the, the first few sessions together, he's like, Ted, this is a practice, right? A lot of us look at the outcome, going back to the, the patience thing. You know, if I do this breath work, this is the outcome that I want. I want stress relief, right? I want calm. I want less anxiety. This is the outcome that I want. But again, that's the wrong focus. This is the practice that you want. The practice mm -hmm. of the breath work is what fulfills me now. The pra like, Sam, I can't wait to like do my breath work and then sit down at my computer and then type afterwards a reflection because also writing and getting some of this junk out of my head, journaling has felt good. So these practices are just that. They're practices that I do constantly and my commitment to that has led to the outcome of, you know, being able to handle things a little better. Now, I still have my days where, there's a funk and like my wife will tell you like, oh, I don't feel like doing anything and I'll be transparent and honest. There was about a month before recording this, 
I missed a morning meeting that was with a charity I was working with and I felt terrible and I spiraled, bro. I spiraled into like, man, maybe I'm just not good to anybody. I'm just no use. And Jess is trying to, she's trying to talk life back into me. She's like, what do you need? I'm like, I just need to cope with this somehow. And I go to the store, I pick up a 12 pack, man. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let me go to the store, pick up a 12 pack. I need to drink this. I need to drink this away. I go home with the 12 pack. But before doing that, she's like, oh, let's go for a walk and everything. She's like, do you want to fill up your ice barrel? Put the ice in your ice barrel, do a cold plunge. And I was like, yeah, you know, let's check that out. And by going for the walk, cold plunge and everything. And then we were talking and then we watched a movie and whatnot. Next thing I know, no, from that morning, it's nine o'clock and I haven't even cracked open that 12 pack yet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I, I don't feel like drinking. Like I made the movements to go drink away my yeah. funk, but then by doing all these other things, I got distracted. And by the end of the day, I didn't feel like touching that beer anymore. So that has been helpful for me getting past funks. It's always come down to these rituals, habits, and routines that I've established in my life that actually feed me. And the reason I think we reach for, whether it be the alcohol, whether it be uh, the a website, right? Or whether it be a, a, a substance, a pill, or, or a drug, we do that to cope because we haven't found other practices in our lives to help us cope with the reality of what we're going through. And that's where I've been focusing on finding the healthier practices versus these vices and these habits, these coping mechanisms, which don't serve me in the long run. Yeah, it's so fascinating because the resistance is a big thing. And we were just talking about this in my private group, Structured Flow and Integration Program. And I led them through some breath work, like nothing crazy, just, you know, before our meeting, about five minutes of grounding. Actually, not really grounding, more activating, more of the sympathetic nervous system than parasympathetic. So to get energy moving. And we had a long dialogue and discussion afterwards about like, will breath work ever not feel like work, you know, because and I told them like, hey, I'm someone who's done like, you know, easily over 30 plus 60 minute plus breathwork journeys in the past few years. So and there was a couple months there a couple of years ago where I would do anywhere from five to 15 minutes of breathwork every single day five to 40 minutes, I should say. There was quite a bit of 40 minute ones. So, you know, pretty well practiced and experienced with breath work. And now I facilitate breath work as well. And every time I go into doing breath work, especially a journey, it's like, oh, shoot. Like, you know, you, it's, it's kind of like a, how a bodybuilder talks about like going into the gym. It's like, oh, you know, I'm a little afraid or, or scared because I know I'm going, you know, wreck myself and it's going to be intense and it's going to be hard. And that's kind of the point, right? You know, and the other side of the coin is humaning. And I love the practice of humaning so much because humaning is more about bringing on the more unconscious behaviors to just chill and be a human and ground and, and be like a 3D creature. And, you know, for me recently, I had, I was talking with you before this about some personal things that I've been going through. So when we are like, quote unquote, going through it, that's when it's like, okay, all hands on deck. And what tools and practices do I need to utilize for this specific moment for what I'm experiencing? And I had a, probably about five, six days of like, really like mentally strong because I was doing those things. And then I hit a point where I was like, okay, I need a human. I need to turn on the TV. I have not turned on the TV once and just like kind of veg out to your point. Uh, but then this is something I've noticed in myself where once I break that habit or like, you know, do that vice, then it's like several days of that vice. And it's so hard to then get out of the funk again. And there's a, a keynote speaker. Do you know Walter Bond? He's a speaker. He's, he's legit. He's dope. But he talks about pity parties. And I love what he talks about pity parties about because he's like, you can have your pity party. Like everyone's talking to me, like, don't have your pity party. He goes, you have your pity party, but you have it for three days. And when those three days are over, that's it. No more. And I think that's really something that it has helped me because, you know, we do fall into that guilt, shame spiral. Like you may have had you not done the ice bath and all the other stuff and just done that, gotten the 12 pack. If that were me, you know, like, 
I probably would have drank for another couple of days. And then it would have been hard for me to get over that hump. So I think all of this is really just having the awareness of what you need in that moment. Because if you have that awareness in the moment, that's how you're going to get over the funk. If you're doing things, then you're human and then you turn into the funk and then it's like, okay, now I got to get out of this. What do I need to do? Okay, well, maybe it's ice bath, maybe it's journaling, all these different things. So yeah, I, I love it all. Is is there more that you'd like to share based off of anything I just shared? Yeah. I mean, I think being able to go through it is huge, right? Like what I remember about that day was the lack of judgment from my surroundings. You know, like I'm going through it and my wife is right there. And I'm like, I'm about to go grab a six pack. She didn't reprimand me. Like, why are you going to do that? You know, Because if anything, that would have pushed me closer to that. Right. So I think it's also important to like, like you said, the humaning aspect of going through it. Like, I just got to sit in this. And sometimes I do have a few drinks. Sometimes I'll relax. I'll veg out. I give myself a day, two days. And the reality is when I pick back up, and that's why Tuesdays are so beneficial for me and Tuesdays leak into Wednesdays. Those are also jam packed for me as well. I've realized like, you know, they say, okay, an idle mind is the devil's playground. And this is the other thing. I realized that after a couple of days, the way my schedule is structured, I can only give myself two, maybe three days max before it's like, it's time to get back to work out of necessity. And because of that, that kind of jump starts the routines that gets me going again, because it can spiral in the opposite direction, right? I could have drank the 12 pack gone to bed, wake up the next day feeling crappy. And then now I'm in a negative state because I have a lack of energy to do what I have to do. And then I'm judging myself for what I did the day before. And then when I need to gear up again, I'm like, oh, I'm just not in it. And that is what has happened in the past where I'm like, man, I just can't get out of this funk. Why? Because I've allowed myself to spiral and I didn't have any tools to pull myself back out. So to kind of elaborate what you mentioned with humaning, you also had those intense practices and you've had that established. And I always tell people when things are good, we need to prepare for when they're bad. So your habits are already locked in. And I do believe that when we have a habit, it never goes away. Those neural pathways are already set. But the reality is just like the neural pathways of me drinking that 12 pack is there, the neural pathways of me ice plunging is also there. And that limits, uh, that reduces the barrier of entry for me to get back on track because I've had those that those habits established on my good days. So when I have my bad days, I have a little bit of an easier time getting back and ramped up. Uh, that, that's so true. And speaking of the neural pathways, you're telling me a little bit about how you've gotten into cognitive behavior recently. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So cognitive behavioral therapy, I, I was just, I did a deep dive and it kind of talks about the interaction between our thoughts our emotions and our behaviors and, and how the three impact the, each other. One impacts the other two. So your behaviors could impact your thoughts and emotions. Your emotions can impact your behaviors and your thoughts. And of course, your thoughts can impact your emotions and behavior. And I looked at those three and as I kind of went down the spiral, they mentioned how, you know, if you kind of like, if you hear people, if you smile, it'll almost like fake you into feeling happier and like mm -hmm. trick your brain and stuff. And I realized like, okay, really the only thing we have control over is our behavior. Because if I tell you, don't think about a pink elephant or don't think about such and such, that's probably exactly where your mind goes. If I bring up maybe an instance where the loss of a loved one, or if I bring up a reminiscence of an amazing time that we had, that probably infiltrates your feelings a little bit, right? You, you might have a feeling based off of a memory that I can bring up, but if I tried to come to where you are, Sam, and tried to like pick you up and take you somewhere, and it, it, it's not going to be easy for me to do. You're going to resist that 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 change. It's not easy to change your behaviors. You have more control of that than the outside world. So the outside world could impact your emotions. The outside world could impact your thoughts, but the outside world does not have the same the same freedom over your behaviors. So when I looked at that, I realized, okay. With that exchange of those three behaviors is really the foundation, which makes sense why I go to the gym, I feel accomplished afterwards, I record podcasts, I feel better afterwards. It all makes sense because 
those three are impacting each other. And when you look at that triangle, honing in on the behaviors can in essence lead to the other two kind of rising the tides and all ships being met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that it's interesting how the two uh, correlate so well in terms of getting out of the funks and get with mm -hmm. the behaviors. That's what, really what it comes down to. And a lot of that too, when you talk about the practice of the breath work that you walk people through and, you know, yoga, you're, you're looking at behaviors that will help impact thoughts and emotions for people, right? You are literally facilitating literally cognitive behavioral therapy. You're facilitating exactly how people can reframe what they go through. Now, other aspects of it is reframing, right? Your perspective of, of something where I remember 2020 to 2021 hit me hard. Like it did a lot of folks with the pandemic. I didn't grow the way I wanted to. And somebody put into context, he's like, well, didn't you buy a house in 2020? Didn't you get married in 2021? So it's like, okay, your bank account might not have grown the way you wanted it to, but Ted, you bought a house, you, you got married, you, you have your pup, like you're, you're building a home. Like that's some pretty significant growth. That's just on a different scale. Big so when, time. You, yeah. when you reframe that, you're like, oh crap. Like, okay, now my thoughts and emotions are different because I reframed exactly how that reality happened. So sometimes we have a, a skewed view of our reality and it takes someone else lovingly reframing it, giving us a different perspective or a new picture that can kind of change how we approach it and how we see it, which is also a helpful way to kind of readjust some of the things that we see in life. Which is such a great segue to get into men's work because, you know, I know you're the modern man podcast, you're passionate about men's mental health. And, you know, for me, I lead men's groups and I'm very passionate about creating containers, whether it's for just men or, you know, non-binary, any gender, really, it doesn't really matter. But speaking to just like kind of your experience in working with men, I'd love to hear you talking about what you're passionate about in, in regard to men's mental health. Yeah. So my, my vision is connecting men in pursuit of their potential. I think there's a lot of guys who are suffering in silence. And to your point, everybody, everybody, it doesn't matter your gender, your identity, it, it, everybody needs community. I wholeheartedly believe that. What I found is men don't do a good job at it. Just mm -hmm. yesterday, I had, you know, two of my boys, we, we were smoking a cigar and my buddy's recapping a vacation he just had. And we're having this camaraderie and a good, genuine, intimate, intimate conversation. And I know when you talk about men hanging out and intimate, that might some people who might have more of a, a elementary way of thinking might be like, oh, intimate men, what's going on there? But like there are different levels of intimacy. You have physical intimacy, which is probably more of the traditional thoughts of sex and stuff like that. But you have spiritual, you have intellectual intimacy, deep conversations, and men are just not good at being intimate with each other on those different levels. A lot of times we might talk about, oh man, did you see that movie? Did you see Creed? Did you see, you know, did you see that game last night? Did you see the John Jones fight? But like, if I'm having a hard time, you know, it's, it's, man, talk to me about what's going on. Hey, you know, me and my wife are having a hard time communicating or, hey, bro, you know, I've been leaning into this vice a little bit too much. I'd, I'd appreciate you keeping me accountable on, you know, not letting me reach for the bottle so much, right? If we're out and I want to order a drink, maybe suggest that I get a club soda, you know, just have my back, right? We don't do that enough. I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, you good? Question mark, hashtag you good. And this is a t-shirt campaign I have on my Modern Man website where all the, the, the proceeds and the profits I'm donating to, you know, men's mental health charities because mm. we don't ask each other, are you good with the intentionality? And the other half is when we're asked, are you good? A lot of times we're like, yeah, I'm fine. And we don't talk about it. So that's why I focused on men's work. That's why it's pulled on my heartstrings because men are silently crying for help. The suicide rate amongst men is, is through the roof. Men commit suicide three and a half times more than women in, two to, in 2020. Now, women do attempt suicide more often, one and a half times more often, but unfortunately, men are a, a lot more su uh, successful at it. If that triggers anybody, I, I urge you, you know, seek help because the, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I don't want to trigger anyone, but I do want to bring to light the fact that we are not talking as men. We are not communicating on an intimate level of what we're actually going through. So what I'm trying to do with the modern man is, is build a community of growth 
and achievement, because we can all get together around that. Like if I'm like, yo, Sam, we're about to do some great things in life. We're about to, you know, crush these goals and set these up. We're going to keep each other accountable. That's great. And I mean, we can build that relationship and that rapport because a lot of guys are isolated. They don't even have guys that they can go after it with. Right. Mm -hmm. So by building that culture, we establish these relationships that are more than just surface level. They could be intimate on a growth level. They could be intimate on a on an ambition level. And that intimacy allows a lower barrier of entry to another area of life. If I'm out there crushing goals with you, working out with you, going through stressful situations with you, there's a bond there. So because we went through the stressful situation of scaling a company, or I went through the stressful situation of sharing like, hey man, I'm having a hard time meeting payroll this, this, this month. Can you help me out? By having the vulnerability in my business, it makes it easier for me to show vulnerability in my marriage, vulnerability in my friendships, vulnerability in my personal life and other aspects so we can have that support ready. So my men's work is really focused on building that community of men who are like-minded, trying to do things, but we're also ready to have each other's back when life punches us in the face, which it certainly is going to punch us in the face at some point in time. I always say as a meteorologist, you're either in a storm, just walking out of one or walking into one. And that's life. Oh, that's, that's really good. What was that again? I was writing down the timestamp. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're either walking into a storm, walking out of a storm or in the storm. You're constantly in that transition, right? And that's just life, right? So for, for people who are in the thick of the storm, you're getting drenched. And for a lot of us who might've just walked out of one. And the best part is if we went through the same storm, right? If I, and I've, we saw one of the recurring topics we've had on the podcast and in our panel discussions and our groups is just divorce, right? Men go through divorce and they isolate and they'll go home. They'll drink alone. They'll be isolated. They don't know where their kids are. Their wives are probably moving on and they don't know how to handle it. But the reality is someone else has been through that storm. Mm -hmm. So if I've been through a storm and I've made it out, just like you have the, the Coast Guard go with the helicopters to pull people out of that sinking boat and everything. They're trained and they're prepared to handle that storm because they've been through it, right? So if a guy's gone through divorce and someone else is just getting into it and they're going through it, this man is equipped, not myself, but in a community, you say, hey, anybody in here has had this experience? Oh, I have. I got you, brother. I'm going to come in here, get wet with you. I'm going to go through the storm. I'm going to grab your hand and I'm going to show you how I got through it. And that's where the community comes into play is when you find out that someone else has been through something that you're going through, it, it doesn't solve the problem because you're still in it, but it also kind of gives you a little bit of hope. Like you made it through. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll be okay. I, I can be okay because you're okay. And you've been able to get through this also. And what comes up for me, and that's beautiful, that's absolutely amazing and inspiring and exactly what our world needs. What comes up for me is rites of passages and kind of a reframe to your point of looking at things as a reframe, like say you're going through a divorce, whatever the thing might be that you're going through and there's someone in the, your network to help support you that's gone through it. If we can look at it as, oh, this is a rite of passage. How is this happening for me, for my expansion, my highest good? Because when we do isolate, that's when we start to have that victim mentality, right? Like, why is this happening to me? I'm so sad and I'm all caught in this. And then the funk happens and who knows from there, it can be way worse than a funk, a massive downward spiral. And that's part of what leads to suicide as well. A lot of time, all of this really, we can directly relate to suicide and I'm a suicide survivor as well as, as they say. And yeah, I'm very passionate about that as well. There was another thing that you said that I thought I wrote down, but maybe I didn't actually about the men's work. And, oh, I remember intimacy. You're talking about the different types of intimacy and Recently, I was experiencing some issues with intimacy and I went to an intimacy workshop and I, I had heard it before. Like, I think there's six. I'm looking over at the corner of the different types of intimacy. I had heard it, but never really, you know, studied it or sat with it. But also, you know, it was something that I was and am going through. And what really clicked for me was emotional intimacy. For me, like I'm big in terms of love language, like words of affirmation, 
you know? So, and just going deep, like spiritual intimacy, of course, like for, I have a podcast called soul seeker, you know, I do, I'm an integration <laughs> coach. Of course, that's a big one, but the emotional intimacy in the relationship I was in was just not there to your point of like your shirts, which are amazing. Hashtag you good check out site. So you can get your own shirt and it goes to nonprofits. That's amazing. I'm gonna get mine, but yeah, yeah. like just, You know, that's the type of conversations that I was having in my relationship where she would always be like asking how I am and like to the point where it was almost at times felt like nagging, you know, like I I am good. Like, should should I not be good? You know, like, (laughs) wait, what's going on? Like, it was almost too much. Right. But then at the times where we would talk about things and like something she was going through or I was going through, we would never go deep enough. You know, we would go just there to address it and then, you know, maybe talk about a solution. And then what happens? Life happens and there's no discipline around the taking action to make a change. And that's something that is alive in me at at the moment of this recording. So when you were talking about the different forms of intimacy, you know, physical intimacy, spiritual, emotional, what else have we got? There's a few more, right? Intellectual. Yeah, the intellectual, I think there's physical. Yeah, there's definitely, it's, and, you know, it, being through, having gone through so many plant and earth medicine ceremonies, as well as breathwork ceremonies and all the different summits and rites of passages in the fellowship fit for service, I've experienced so much intimacy that is far deeper than any sex that I've ever experienced. And it's, amazing how powerful it can be when we really let down our mask and let down the armor and let others fully see us, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and to that point, like as men, we're really good at one of those intimacies. We're really yeah. good at the physical intimacy, right? How many guys are out there trying to just get another notch on their belt, right? Up their body count. And, and the fact of the matter is that physical intimacy is usually the pursuit that men have because a different intimacy is is lacking. And for a lot of us, we're terrible at the emotional intimacy. To be transparent, that's something I'm still working on because when I talk with my wife and she actually, she alluded to something, she's seen me cry like a handful of times. But recently, she's seen me cry a little bit more. She's like, you're, you're starting to cry a little bit more. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting better at releasing this, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it used to be like, again, I was so calloused and conditioned to hold it down, Ted, hold it down. But one of the best analogies I heard is like, when you have these emotions and as men, when we talk to man up, boys don't cry, this, that, the other thing, we are terrible with emotional intimacy and we are terrible at identifying what our emotions are in the first place. So we always just chuck it up to I'm angry or I'm mad or I'm happy. You know, that's it. That's it. We got two. Two, yeah. two speeds. But like the reality is when you have those emotions that you're holding down, it's like a beach ball that you're holding underwater. The longer you hold it underwater and the deeper you hold it underwater, the more that thing's going to come popping up and mm-hmm. it's going to come up aggressively, right? So we don't have the, the practice of sharing intimately our emotions. And that is kind of what is lacking for us. And we, we offset that and we try and compensate for that with the physical pursuit, with the body count, with the like, okay, if I just get another one, another, maybe this will fill me up. Maybe this will make me feel fulfilled, but it's not working. It's an endless funnel. That's not going to fill up because it's the wrong, it's the wrong path that we're going. We're not looking for that physical intimacy. We're looking for more of maybe that spiritual, emotional intimacy where I could sit in a space and it's important, right? I could sit in a space and say, okay, I'm not sure what I'm feeling. This is this is the best thing we could do for each other as men. I'm not sure what I'm feeling, bro, but you know, this is just the the unfinished unpacking of it. All right. Well, why does it make you feel that way? What else does that make you feel? You know, wh- what do you think where do you think that's coming from? Asking these questions without trying to immediately fix it or not trying to oh, come on, man, that's not a big deal. Right? Don't dismiss it. Just let's sit here together and like, all right, man, I might not have the answer right away, but I could sit here with intentional questions to help you unpack it and go through it. And we might not even get to an answer, but the fact that we sit through that process together is therapeutic. 
hundred percent. So well said. And yeah, the fix it pandemic is a real thing. That's something I talk about in my book, Soul Life Balance. The crying, I would like to just touch on crying for a bit, because like I mentioned, I, I've been going through it for a few weeks now. And yesterday I had, for me, a big release with crying, but like no one was at my house, just my dog, just me. Right. And I'm meditating doing Honopono Ono. Right. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Just meditating with that. Right. And I feel these emotions. I feel some tears come. My initial reaction is to stop. You know, it's like shame, embarrassment, all this stuff. And for all the work that I've done, right, still like I have a block with crying and I'm sitting there like having a mental discussion with myself, like, it's okay, let it go, let it go. And, you know, I the tears start to come down because usually for me, the type of crier I am is like one slow, steady tear, yeah, you know. Glory. <laughs> what, what do you call it? Glory, like Denzel Washington and Glory, where he just got that one T. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like that. Glory. I, I don't know if I've seen that. I got to watch that. I love Denzel. Glory. It's an old one. Yeah, it's a good okay. one. It's an old one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I'm going to write that down because his movies are always incredible. Anyways, yeah, just like that, that one tear. And, you know, yesterday or even the past few days, you know, more tears are building and I, I start to let them go. But there's still like this resistance and it's something to hold on to. And like through all of the work that I've done, like tears is one of the main things where I still constantly have a block. Is there something that has been working well for you to let those waterworks flow? I mean, I would also say I agree with you that I still have a block when it comes to the tears. I think what's helped me um, was lack of judgment being being able to to sit in it and and the first time the first time i remember feeling that lack of judgment was after i was disappointed at the outcome of a competition i gave my all into and i cried and i think that was the first time my my now wife girlfriend at the time saw me cry and she was there to comfort me and she said thank you and that was un that was uncommon for me, you know, and she expressed gratitude for letting her see me in that. Mm -hmm. And I think when she expressed gratitude for that, it helped reframe some of my thinking around, you know, what, cause like, I mean, again, like I was calloused, right? I, my boys don't see me cry. My, my parents don't see me cry. I've seen my dad cry twice in his life. Like that's, this just, I've never seen it. It's never been something that was around me. But like when that happened and I broke down when she was like, thank you. I was like, oh, okay. This is not only is this okay, but this was, this was something she was grateful for to be a part of. And then it was a very long time before I cried again. Uh, so I think what's helped me was an outside validation. And that I think was, the, the scary part for me because I've cried before in, in isolation, you know, and in crying in isolation, sure, I had the release. However, it still wasn't okay, if that makes sense, right? Because I mean, I think for, I, I always say this, like we could have vices. I, I mentioned earlier, whether it be a substance, whether it be a website or, or something we do, someone drinking alone at home, usually they do it away from others. Right. So just because we do something doesn't mean it's validated. So we can cry in isolation, but I think the outward validation is what helps in that. Because, for example, if my habit is going to a website every time I need a dopamine hit, I don't, I can't do that. If I were to do that in front of my wife, that probably wouldn't go well. Right. That probably wouldn't be something that's received with a thank you. And that's, and that would be a reminder. And that would probably be the world telling me like, oh, oh, that's not good, which is why I keep it in isolation. So I think that was the, the, the big help for me was having that support, having that system, which is also why with, when it comes to men's work, you know, we've had our groups where, you know, just one of the guys going through it, life being heavy, him not feeling strong enough, tears come out, met with embracement. We, we got you validation like it's okay bro we got you and i know what it's like to be there too let those tears flow because we're going to heal through this together 
Yeah, I, I think being vulnerable with other men and that can really be profound like that. Not not being vulnerable, like, like, oh, be vulnerable and talk about something, you know, like what you're talking about, like breaking down in tears and being held by another man. And what you're talking about with your wife, I think you mentioned you were dating at the time, brought me back about seven, eight years ago before I was doing the work and in a relationship, a breakup with my girlfriend at the time. And I remember I started crying like hard, you know, and I was breaking up with her too, you know, but it's, it's, it's always hard. Right. And I remember her coming over and comforting me. And even though we are breaking up and I was breaking up with her and I totally forgot about that till you mentioned that. So thank you for that reminder. And that was a, a turning point in that relationship. We ended up getting back together for a bit. And just for me, I think it was start of, you know, the path of doing the work and looking within and being like, no, I, I don't have to act like I'm so tough, you know, because yeah. I'm a man. Oh, yeah. is society. Yeah. And if I could unpack that, because it's, it's, it's always um, a delicate topic, right? Because I mean, if anybody knows me, they see me work out, like there's this ruggedness to me, right? Which is important. But what I always articulate it as, I do think there are times as men, we are charged with stepping up. We are charged with however we feel there's a mission that needs to be done and we need to accomplish it. But the problem, I think, is we are conditioned and taught that that's how we have to be all the time. And that's just not feasible. We need to unload our stuff somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. In order for us to be strong, in order for us to be capable and able of holding it down when we need to, we need to also have an outlet to let go. Because I'm a huge proponent of like, you know, be that strong, admirable man that you look up to. But again, I always use the suit of armor as an example. Don't be that strong, admirable man with a clean suit of armor. Have a rugged suit of armor because a clean suit of armor has never gone to battle, right? You need the dents, the vulnerabilities, the scratches. If I'm about to go to war and there's two people that can, I can go to war with, do I want the guy with a clean suit of armor who's standing there like, I got this? Or do I want the guy who is battered up, rugged, still there and like, oh, I've been through this before, bro. <laughs> I'm picking that guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm picking that guy. Let's go to battle, bro. Because yes, you have those vulnerabilities on you, but you've also been in the game. You've had that battle. You've survived the battle and you've lived to tell it. So that's why I think it's important for us as men to rise up to those challenges. We do things hard in life intentionally. I do the gym. I give challenges in life myself. You talk about rites of passages. Those are all things that help us grow that confidence and our competence. But again, on top of that, the opposite side is being able to unload and let go of some of those things that we hold on to too much because no person, I'm not just going to say man here, no person should have to hold that forever. 100%, bro. Ted, thank you so much. This has been excellent. Before we close out, I have recently updated the tagline, the podcast to ignite magic daily. It's, it's, yeah. So I'd love to hear from you. What's, what's one way that comes to mind that you can ignite that magic? The, when I say magic, meaning like the synchronicities, the God winks of life. Yeah. Gratitude. I think one thing I've been focusing on waking up at 2 20 in the morning is for the Birds, sounds bro. brutal. It's for the birds. It's for the worms because the early bird gets the worm, which means the worms are up before the birds. But I, I think I wake up and I and I get off the snooze button. I don't snooze. Two twenty alarm goes off. I'm up and I'm in the and I'm in the bathroom brushing my teeth. But I always have this mental checklist with myself. With this mental thought to myself is like, I get another day. I'm I'm still here and like, what am I gonna do with this day? And, and I'm not checking my phone. I don't check my phone or anything until I get to work, which is usually 45 minutes after I wake up. So I have that time to myself for just me and my thoughts. I don't let the outside stimulus impact my world. So I think the best thing we could do to ignite that light is take ownership of our light early in the day. When you wake up, don't check your phone. Don't look at what's, what the world is going to be sending you. Don't look check your messages, anything that came in overnight, because that's going to infiltrate your thoughts, feelings, and emotions right away. 
you're leaving that up to somebody else. By spending that first few few minutes, the first half hour, 45 minutes of your day with yourself and your thoughts with gratitude, okay, I get a chance at another one. Hey, how do I feel today? I ask myself, all the time, how do I feel today? I don't mm-hmm. feel that great, but you know, I'm up, I'm at them, you know, and l- let's get after it. That helps me ignite my mentality, my approach to the world every day before the outside influences take hold. I love that. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for sharing that and so much good wisdom in here. I love how you show up in the world and, you know, felt connected with you when we first connected. So this is just beginning. I'm sure we'll find some capacity to be partnering on events or any things like that in the future. And guys, make sure to connect with Ted. Check out his podcast, The Modern Man. He is a meteorologist by 2.20 a.m. Not the day, kind of the night, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, all all the good stuff and also Emmy Award winner. You got a lot of things going on, bro. And the the you good shirts too. So much goodness here. So thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And, and everybody, make sure to give Sam his flowers. Give him the rating. Share this episode because Sam, you're doing an amazing job, amazing work. And it's just, it's an honor to be part of it, brother. Thank you, my dude.